Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by E. F. Benson. The Face. Hester Ward, sitting by the open window on this hot afternoon in June, began to seriously argue with herself about the cloud of foreboding and depression which had encompassed her all day, and, very sensibly, she enumerated to herself the manifold causes for happiness in the fortunate circumstances of her life. She was young, she was extremely good-looking, she was well-off, she enjoyed excellent health, and above all, she had an adorable husband and two small, adorable children. There was no break, indeed, anywhere in the circle of prosperity which surrounded her, and had the wishing cap been handed to her that moment by some beneficent fairy, she would have hesitated to put it on her head, for there was positively nothing that she could think of which would have been worthy of such solemnity. Moreover, she could not accuse herself of a want of appreciation of her blessings. She appreciated enormously, she enjoyed enormously, and she thoroughly wanted all those who munificently contributed to her happiness to share it. She made a very deliberate review of these things, for she was really anxious, more anxious, indeed, than she admitted to herself, to find anything tangible which could possibly warrant this ominous feeling of approaching disaster. Then there was the weather to consider. For the last week, London had been stiflingly hot. But if that was the cause, why had she not felt it before? Perhaps the effect of these broiling, airless days had been cumulative. That was an idea, but, frankly, it did not seem a very good one. For, as a matter of fact, she loved the heat. Dick, who hated it, said that it was odd that he should have fallen in love with a salamander. She shifted her position, sitting up straight in this low window seat, for she was intending to make a call on her courage. She had known from the moment she awoke this morning what it was that lay heavy upon her, and now, having done her best to shift the reason of her depression onto anything else, and having completely failed, she meant to look the thing in the face. She was ashamed for doing so, for the cause of this leaden mood of fear which held her in its grip was so trivial, so fantastic, so excessively silly. Yes, there never was anything so silly, she said to herself. I must look at it straight and convince myself how silly it is. She paused a moment, clenching her hands. Now for it, she said. She had had a dream the previous night, which, years ago, used to be familiar to her. For again and again, when she was a child, she had dreamed it. In itself, the dream was nothing. But in those childish days, whenever she had this dream which had visited her last night, it was followed on the next night by another, which contained the source and the core of the horror, and she would awake screaming and struggling in the grip of overwhelming nightmare. For some ten years now she had not experienced it, and would have said that, though she remembered it, it had become dim and distant to her. But last night she had had that warning dream, which used to herald the visitation of the nightmare, and now that whole storehouse of memory, crammed as it was with bright things and beautiful, contains nothing so vivid. The warning dream, the curtain that was drawn up on the succeeding night, and disclosed the vision she dreaded, was simple and harmless enough in itself. She seemed to be walking on a high, sandy cliff covered with short down grass. Twenty yards to the left came the edge of this cliff, which sloped steeply down to the sea that lay at its foot. The path she followed led through fields bounded by low hedges, and mounted gradually upwards. She went through some half-dozen of these, climbing over the wooden stiles that gave communication. Sheep grazed there, but she never saw another human being, and always it was dusk as if evening was falling, and she had to hurry on, because someone, she knew not whom, was waiting for her, and had been waiting not a few minutes only, but for many years. Presently, as she mounted this slope, she saw in front of her a copse of stunted trees growing crookedly under the continual pressure of the wind that blew from the sea. And when she saw those, she knew her journey was nearly done, and that the nameless one, who had been waiting for her so long, was somewhere close at hand. The path she followed was cut through this wood, and the slanting boughs of the trees on the seaward side almost roofed it in. It was like walking through a tunnel. Soon the trees in front began to grow thin, and she saw through them the gray tower of a lonely church. It stood in a graveyard, apparently long disused. 
and the body of the church, which lay between the tower and the edge of the cliff, was in ruins, roofless, and with gaping windows, round which ivy grew thickly. At that point this prefatory dream always stopped. It was a troubled, uneasy dream, for there was over it the sense of dusk, and of the man who had been waiting for her so long. But it was not of the order of nightmare. Many times in childhood had she experienced it, and perhaps it was the subconscious knowledge of the night that so surely followed it, which gave it its disquiet. And now last night it had come again, identical in every particular but one. Last night it seemed to her that in the course of these ten years which had intervened since it last visited her, the glimpse of the church in the churchyard was changed. The edge of the cliff had come nearer to the tower, so that it now was within a yard or two of it, and the ruined body of the church, but for one broken arch that remained, had vanished. The sea had encroached, and for ten years had been busily eating at the cliff. Hester knew well that it was this dream and this alone which had darkened the day for her, by reason of the nightmares that used to follow it, and, like a sensible woman, having looked at once in the face, she refused to admit into her mind any conscious calling up of the sequel. If she let herself contemplate that, as likely or not the very thinking about it would be sufficient to ensure its return, and of one thing she was very certain, namely, that she didn't at all want it to do so. It was not like the confused jumble and jangle of ordinary nightmare. It was very simple, and she felt it concerned the nameless one who waited for her. But she must not think of it. Her whole will and intention was set to not thinking of it. And to aid her resolution, there was the rattle of Dick's latch key in the front door, and his voice calling her. She went out into the little square front hall. There he was, strong and large, and wonderfully undreamlike. This heat's a scandal. It's an outrage. It's an abomination of desolation, he cried, vigorously mopping. What have we done that Providence should place us in this frying pan? Let us thwart him, Hester. Let us drive out of this inferno and have our dinner at, I'll whisper it so that he shan't overhear, at Hampton Court. She laughed. This plan suited her excellently. They would return late, after the distraction of a fresh scene, and dining out at night was both delicious and stupefying. The very thing, she said, and I'm sure Providence didn't hear. Let's start now. Rather, any letters for me? He walked to the table where there are a few rather uninteresting-looking envelopes with half-penny stamps. Ah, receipted bill, he said. Just a reminder of one's folly in paying it. Circular, unasked advice to invest in German marks. Circular begging letter, beginning, Dear Sir or Madam. Such impertinence to ask one to subscribe to something without ascertaining one's sex. Private view, portraits at the Walton Gallery. Can't go, business meetings all day. You might like to have a look in, Hester. Someone told me there were some fine Van Dykes. That's all. Let's be off. Hester spent a thoroughly reassuring evening, and though she thought of telling Dick about the dream that had so deeply imprinted itself on her consciousness all day, in order to hear the great laugh he would have given her for being such a goose, she refrained from doing so, since nothing he could say would be so tonic to these fantastic fears as his general robustness. Besides, she would have to account for its disturbing effect, tell him that it was once familiar to her, and recount the sequel of nightmares that followed. She would neither think of them nor mention them. It was wiser by far just to soak herself in his extraordinary sanity and wrap herself in his affection. They dined out of doors at a riverside restaurant and strolled about afterwards, and it was very nearly midnight when, soothed with coolness and fresh air, and the vigor of his strong companionship, she let herself into the house while he took the car back to the garage. And now she marveled at the mood which had beset her all day, so distant and unreal had it become. She felt as if she had dreamed of shipwreck, and had awoke to find herself in some secure and sheltered garden, where no tempest raged nor waves beat. But was there, ever so remotely, ever so dimly, the noise of far-off breakers somewhere? He slept in the dressing room which communicated with her bedroom, the door of which was left open for the sake of air and coolness, and she fell asleep almost as soon as her light was out, and while his was still burning. And immediately she began to dream. She was standing on the seashore. The tide was out, 
for level sands strewn with stranded jetsam glimmered in a dusk that was deepening into night. Though she had never seen the place, it was awfully familiar to her. At the head of the beach there was a steep cliff of sand, and perched on the edge of it was a gray church tower. The sea must have encroached and undermined the body of the church, for tumbled blocks of masonry lay close to her at the bottom of the cliff, and there were gravestones there, while others still in place were silhouetted whitely against the sky. To the right of the church tower there was a wood of stunted trees, combed sideways by the prevalent sea wind, and she knew that along the top of the cliff a few yards inland there lay a path through fields, with wooden stiles to climb, which led through a tunnel of trees and so out to the churchyard. All this she saw in a glance, and waited, looking at the sand cliff crowned by the church tower, for the terror that was going to reveal itself. Already she knew what it was, and, as so many times before, she tried to run away. But the catalepsy of nightmare was already on her. Frantically she strove to move, but her utmost endeavor could not raise a foot from the sand. Frantically she tried to look away from the sand cliffs close in front of her, where in a moment now the horror would be manifested. It came. There formed a pale oval light, the size of a man's face, dimly luminous in front of her and a few inches above the level of her eyes. It outlined itself. Short reddish hair grew low on the forehead. Below were two gray eyes, set very close together, which steadily and fixedly regarded her. On each side the eyes stood noticeably away from the head, and the lines of the jaw met in a short, pointed chin. The nose was straight and rather long. Below it came a hairless lip. And last of all, the mouth took shape and color, and there lay the crowning terror. One side of it, soft, curved, and beautiful, trembled into a smile. The other side, thick and gathered together by some physical deformity, sneered and lusted. The whole face, dim at first, gradually focused itself into clear outline. It was pale and rather lean, the face of a young man. And then the lower lip dropped a little, showing the glint of teeth. And there was the sound of speech. I shall come for you now, it said. And on those words it drew a little closer to her, and the smile broadened. At that the full hot blast of nightmare poured in upon her. Again she tried to run, again she tried to scream, and now she could feel the breath of that terrible mouth upon her. Then with a crash and a rending like the tearing asunder of soul and body, she broke the spell, and heard her own voice yelling, and felt with their fingers for the switch of her light. And then she saw that the room was not dark, for Dick's door was open, and the next moment, not yet undressed, he was with her. "'My darling, what is it?' he said. "'What's the matter?' She clung desperately to him, still distraught with terror. "'Ah, he has been here again,' she cried. "'He says he will soon come to me. Keep him away, Dick.' For one moment her fear infected him, and he found himself glancing around the room. "'But what do you mean?' he said. "'No one has been here.' She raised her head from his shoulder. "'No, it was just a dream,' she said. "'But it was the old dream, and I was terrified. "'Why, you've not undressed yet. What time is it?' You haven't been in bed ten minutes, dear, he said. You had hardly put out your light when I heard you screaming. She shuddered. Ah, it's awful, she said, and he will come again. He sat down by her. Now tell me all about it, he said. She shook her head. No, it will never do to talk about it, she said. It will only make it more real. I suppose the children are all right, are they? Of course they are. I looked in on them on my way upstairs. That's good. But I'm better now, Dick. A dream hasn't anything real about it, has it? It doesn't mean anything. He was quite reassuring on this point, and soon she quieted down. Before he went to bed he looked in again on her, and she was asleep. Hester had a stern interview with herself when Dick had gone down to his office next morning. She told herself that what she was afraid of was nothing more than her own fear. How many times had that ill-omened face come to her in her dreams? And what significance had it ever proved to possess? Absolutely none at all, except to make her afraid. She was afraid where no fear was. She was guarded, sheltered, prosperous. And what if a nightmare of childhood returned? It had no more meaning now than it had then, 
and all those visitations of her childhood had passed away without trace. And then, despite herself, she began thinking over that vision again. It was grimly identical with the previous occurrences, except... And then, with a sudden shrinking of the heart, she remembered that in earlier years those terrible lips had said, I shall come for you when you are older. And last night they had said, I shall soon come for you now. She remembered, too, that in the warning dream the sea had encroached, and it had now demolished the body of the church. There was an awful consistency about these two changes in the otherwise identical visions. The years had brought their change to them, for in the one the encroaching sea had brought down the body of the church, and in the other the time was now near. It was no use to scold or reprimand herself, for to bring to her mind the contemplation of the vision meant merely the grip of terror closing on her again. It was far wiser to occupy herself and starve her fear out by refusing to bring it the sustenance of thought. So she went about her household duties. She took the children out for their airing in the park, and then, determined to leave no moment unoccupied, set off with the card of invitation to see the pictures in the private view at the Walton Gallery. After that her day was full enough, she was lunching out and going on to a matinee, and by the time she got home Dick would have returned, and they would drive down to his little house at Rye for the weekend. All Saturday and Sunday she would be playing golf, and she felt that fresh air and physical fatigue would exercise the dread of these dreaming fantasies. The gallery was crowded when she got there. There were friends among the sightseers, and the inspection of the pictures was diversified by cheerful conversation. There were two or three fine Rayburns, a couple of Sir Joshua's, but the gems, so she gathered, were the three Van Dykes that hung in a small room by themselves. Presently she strolled in there, looking at her catalogue. The first of them she saw was a portrait of Sir Roger Wyburn. Still chatting to her friend, she raised her eye and saw it. Her heart hammered in her throat, and then seemed to stand still altogether. A qualm, as of some mental sickness of the soul, overcame her, for there in front of her was he who would soon come for her. There was the reddish hair, the projecting ears, the greedy eyes set close together, and the mouth smiling on one side, and on the other gathered up into the sneering menace she knew so well. It might have been her own nightmare rather than a living model, which had sat to the painter for that face. Ah, what a portrait, and what a brute, said her companion. Look, Hester, isn't that marvelous? She recovered herself with an effort. To give way to this ever-mastering dread would have been to allow nightmare to invade her waking life, and there, for sure, madness lay. She forced herself to look at it again, but there were the steady and eager eyes regarding her. She could almost fancy the mouth began to move. All around her the crowd bustled and chattered, but to her own sense she was alone there with Roger Wyburn. And yet, so she reasoned with herself, this picture of him, for it was he and no other, should have reassured her. Roger Wyburn, to have been painted by Van Dyke, must have been dead near on two hundred years. How could he be a menace to her? Had she seen that portrait by some chance as a child? Had it made some dreadful impression on her, since overscored by other memories, but still alive in the mysterious subconscious? which flows eternally, like some dark underground river beneath the surface of human life? Psychologists taught that those early impressions fester or poison the mind like some hidden abscess. That might account for this dread of one, nameless no longer, who waited for her. That night down at Rye there came again to her the prefatory dream, followed by the nightmare, and clinging to her husband as the terror began to subside, she told him what she had resolved to keep to herself. Just to tell it brought a measure of comfort, for it was so outrageously fantastic, and his robust common sense upheld her. But when on their return to London there was a reoccurrence of these visions, he made short work of her demur and took her straight to her doctor. Tell him all, darling, he said. Unless you promise to do that, I will. I can't have you worried like this. It's all nonsense, you know, and doctors are wonderful people for curing nonsense. She turned to him. Dick, you are frightened, she said quietly. He laughed. I'm nothing of the kind, he said, but I don't like being awakened by your screaming. Not my idea of a peaceful night. Here we are, 
the medical report was decisive and peremptory. There was nothing whatever to be alarmed about. In brain and body she was perfectly healthy, but she was run down. These disturbing dreams were, as likely as not, an effect, a symptom of her condition, rather than the cause of it, and Dr. Baring unhesitatingly recommended a complete change to some bracing place. The wise thing would be to send her out of this stuffy furnace to some quiet place where she had never been. Complete change, quite so. For the same reason her husband had better not go with her. He must pack her off to, let us say, the East Coast. Sea air and coolness and complete idleness. No long walks, no long bathings. A dip and a deck chair in the sands. A lazy, sophoric life. How about Rushton? He had no doubt that Rushton would set her up again. After a week or so, perhaps, her husband might go down and see her. Plenty of sleep, never mind the nightmares. Plenty of fresh air. Hester, rather to her husband's surprise, fell in with the suggestion at once, and the following evening saw her installed in solitude and tranquility. The little hotel was still almost empty, for the rush of summer tourists had not yet begun, and all day she sat out on the beach with a sense that the struggle was over. She need not fight the terror any more. Dimly it seemed to her that its malignancy had been relaxed. Had she in some way yielded to it and done its secret bidding? At any rate, no return of its nightly visitations had occurred, and she slept long and dreamlessly, and woke to another day of quiet. Every morning there was a line for her from Dick, with good news of himself and the children, but he and they alike seemed somehow remote, like memories of a very distant time. Something had driven in between her and them, and she saw them as if through glass. But equally did the memory of the face of Roger Wyburn, as seen on the master's canvas, or hanging close in front of her against the crumbling sand cliff, become blurred and indistinct, and no return of her nightly terrors visited her. This truce from all emotion reacted not on her mind alone, lulling her with a sense of soothed security, but on her body also, and she began to weary of this day-long inactivity. The village lay on the lip of a stretch of land reclaimed from the sea. To the north the level marsh, now beginning to glow with the pale bloom of sea lavender, stretched away featureless till it lost itself in distance. But to the south a spur of hill came down to the shore ending in a wooden promontory. Gradually, as her physical health increased, she began to wonder what lay beyond this ridge which cut short the view. And one afternoon she walked across the intervening level and strolled up its wooded slopes. The day was close and windless. The invigorating sea breeze, which till now had spiced the heat with freshness, had died, and she looked forward to finding a current of air stirring when she had topped the hill. To the south a mass of dark cloud lay along the horizon, but there was no imminent threat of a storm. The slope was easily surmounted, and presently she stood at the top and found herself on the edge of a tableland of wooded pasture, and following the path, which ran not far from the edge of the cliff, she came out into more open country. Empty fields, where a few sheep were grazing, mounted gradually upwards. Wooden stiles made a communication in the hedges that bound them. And there, not a mile in front of her, with trees growing slantingly away from the push of the prevalent sea winds, crowning the upward slope, and over the top of it peered a gray church tower. For the moment, as the awful and familiar scene identified itself, Hester's heart stood still. The next a wave of courage and resolution poured in upon her. Here at last was the scene of the prefatory dream, and here was she presented with the opportunity of fathoming and dispelling it. Instantly her mind was made up, and under the strange twilight of the shrouded sky, she walked swiftly on through the fields she had so often traversed in sleep, and up to the wood, beyond which he was waiting for her. She closed her ears against the clanging bell of terror, which now she could silence forever, and unfalteringly entered that dark tunnel of wood. Soon in front of her the trees began to thin, and through them, now close at hand, she saw the church tower. In a few yards farther, she came out of the belt of trees, and round her were the monuments of a graveyard long disused. The cliff was broken off close to the church tower. Between it and the edge there was no more of a body of the church than a broken arch, thick hung with ivy. Round this she passed and saw below the ruin of fallen masonry, and the level sands strewn with headstones and disjected rubble. And at the edge of the cliff were graves already cracked and toppling. 
But there was no one there. No one waited for her, and the churchyard where she had so often pictured him was as empty as the fields she had just traversed. A huge elation filled her. Her courage had been rewarded, and all the terrors of the past became to her meaningless phantoms. But there was no time to linger, for now the storm threatened, and on the horizon a blink of lightning was followed by a crackling peal. Just as she turned to go, her eye fell on a tombstone that was balanced on the very edge of the cliff and she read on it that there lay the body of Roger Wyburn. Fear, the catalepsy of nightmare, rooted her for a moment to the spot. She stared in stricken amazement at the moss-grown letters. Almost she expected to see that fell terror of a face rise and hover over his resting place. Then the fear which had frozen her lent her wings, and with hurrying feet she sped through the arched pathway in the wood and out into the fields. Not one backward glance did she give till she had come to the edge of the ridge above the village, and, turning, saw the pasture she had traversed empty of any living presence. No one had followed. But the sheep, apprehensive of the coming storm, had ceased to feed, and were huddling under shelter of the stunted hedges. Her first idea, in the panic of her mind, was to leave the place at once, but the last train for London had left an hour before, and besides, what was the use of flight if it was the spirit of a man long dead from which she fled? The distance from his place where his bones lay did not afford her safety. That must be sought for within. But she longed for Dick's sheltering and confident presence. He was arriving in any case tomorrow. But there were long, dark hours before tomorrow. And who could say what the perils and dangers of the coming night might be? If he started this morning instead of tomorrow morning, he could motor down here in four hours, and would be with her by ten o'clock or eleven. She wrote an urgent telegram. Come at once, she said. Don't delay. The storm which had flickered on the south now came quickly up, and soon after it burst in appalling violence. For preface there were but a few large drops that splashed and dried on the roadway as she came back from the post office, and just as she reached the hotel again the roar of the approaching rain sounded, and the sluices of heaven were opened. Through the deluge flared the fire of the lightning. The thunder crashed and echoed overhead, and presently the street of the village was a torrent of sandy, turbulent water, and sitting there in the dark one picture kept floating before her eyes, that of the tombstone of Roger Wyburn, already tottering to its fall at the edge of the cliff of the church tower. In such rains as these, acres of the cliffs were loosened. She seemed to hear the whisper of the sliding sand that would precipitate those parish sepulchres and what lay within to the beach below. By eight o'clock the storm was subsiding, and as she dined she was handed a telegram from Dick, saying that he had already started and sent this off en route. By half-past ten, therefore, if all was well, he would be here, and somehow he would stand between her and her fear. Strange how a few days ago both it and the thought of him had become distant and dim to her. Now the one was as vivid as the other, and she counted the minutes to his arrival. And looking out of the curtained window of her sitting room where she sat watching the slow cycle of the hands on the clock, she saw a tawny moon rising over the sea. Before it had climbed to the zenith, before her clock had twice told her the hour again, Dick would be with her. It had just struck ten when there came a knock at her door, and the page-boy entered with the message that a gentleman had come for her. Her heart leaped at the news. She had not expected Dick for half an hour yet, and now the lonely vigil was over. She ran downstairs, and there was the figure standing on the step outside. His face was turned away from her. No doubt he was giving some order to his chauffeur. He was outlined against the white moonlight, and in contrast with that, the gas jet in the entrance just above his head gave his hair a warm, reddish tinge. She ran across the hall to him. Ah, my darling, you've come, she said. It was good of you. How quick you've been. Just as she laid her hand on his shoulder, he turned. His arm was thrown out round her, and she looked into a face with the eyes close set, and a mouth smiling on one side, the other, thick and gathered together as by some physical deformity, sneered and lusted. The nightmare was upon her. She could neither run nor scream. And supported by her dragging steps, he went forth with her into the night. Half an hour later, Dick arrived. To his amazement, he heard that a man had called for his wife not long before, 
and that she had gone out with him. He seemed to be a stranger here, for the boy who had taken his message to her had never seen him before, and presently surprise began to deepen into alarm. Inquiries were made outside the hotel, and it appeared that a witness or two had seen the lady whom they knew to be staying here walking, hatless, along the top of the beach with a man whose arm was linked in hers. Neither of them knew him, but one had seen his face and could describe it. The direction of the church thus became narrowed down, and though with a lantern to supplement the moonlight they came upon footprints which might have been hers, there were no marks of any that walked beside her. But they followed these until they came to an end, a mile away, in a great landslide of sand, which had fallen from the old churchyard on the cliff, and had brought down with it half the tower and a gravestone with the body that had lain below. The gravestone was that of Roger Wyburn, and his body lay by it, untouched by corruption or decay, though two hundred years had elapsed since it was interred there. For a week afterwards the work of searching the landslide went on, assisted by the high tides that gradually washed it away, but no further discovery was made. The End